Father, even in the final hour, in the name of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray that the light of the gospel will shine in the face of those whom it's been hid from, in the name of Jesus. Pull down religious strongholds, sacred cows, in the name of Jesus. Father, those who are in the way, move them, move them, move us, the spirit, Lord, that we carry out of the way. Help us to decrease in the name of Jesus. Order a new day. Bring in salvation as never before. Save the lost. Save those who are sitting by the wayside, those who have grown cold in their walk. We pray that you would send a fire, the fires of the Holy Ghost to stir their lives, those who have become indifferent, those, Father, who have become insensitive to the power and the moving of the Spirit, those who are feeling entitled, O oh God, to the blessings of heaven. Father, we are asking in the name of Jesus Christ that you would minister grace to their ears. Forgive them. Forgive us, forgive your body, forgive this world, O oh God, for the way we have treated your son. So we pray now for light. Holy Spirit, we can do nothing without you. We can do nothing without you. You are the teacher. You are the reprover. You are the rebuker. You are the comforter. You are the exhorter. You are the one who manifests Jesus through us. Oh, so we ask you in the name of Jesus, help us to decrease that Christ may increase. In the name of Jesus, Satan, we recognize your agenda and we trample on you. Father, we pray that unclean spirits with loud voices would begin to cry out across the globe as your children begin to declare your name. As never before, we pray, Lord, in every city, every village, every hamlet, God, every small place, every large place where the name of Jesus is declared, that light would begin to shine as never before. Never before. Lord, we expected you to come one way, but we pray that, Lord, you would just come in, usher in a moving of your spirit and your power to change this world, to change our nation, to change our circumstances and situation. We're open. We're ready. We're waiting in the name of Jesus Christ. We realize we can do nothing without you. Without you, we are nothing but failures in the name of Jesus. All our schisms and isms and our tricks and our gimmicks, Lord, they will not work. In the name of Jesus Christ, we need your power. It's not by power, not by might, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, speak thou from heaven. Speak once again. Speak, Lord, from your great throne. In the name of Jesus, through the power of your spirit. Oh, God, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And we will give you the praise. We're going to give you the honor give you the glory in the name of Jesus. We're going to give you the honor. We're going to give you the glory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Handicap no more. Handicap no more, handicap no more, handicap no more, handicap no more. And there's a great deal of handicap parking going on, handicap parking going on. A lot of people are uh, fighting in the parking lots for handicapped spots. Yeah, they're fighting now. Handicapped people have become very aggressive. They will. They will get out of their wheelchair and come across the parking lot. And shake their bony finger in your face to tell you, you have taken my parking space. 
Handicapped people are not playing about them parking spaces and about them parking them uh, carts in the store. And there's a great deal of people who are handicapped. And uh, there are a great deal of people who got handicapped parking stickers that they're carrying them illegal to. <laughs> so it's the new thing. Amen. A handicapped parking sticker. It's, it's, it's first class parking. Amen. If you got one, you can be late and still get a good parking. Praise God. Amen. People will steal these out of your cars. So they're worth something. Amen. They're worth something. Amen. You can probably sell these and scalp them on the black market if you can, if you can make them. Amen. They got a punch date on them when they expire, and so they are worth something. So handicap no more. Reason I'm going to uh, talk to us tonight, amen, those of you here and those who are, who are watching about handicap no more because of something that the Lord showed me, praise God, in his word tonight. I'm going to ask you if you would turn with me to the book of John chapter 5. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. And I'm going to begin reading. In John chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And this, after this, excuse me, there was a feast of the Jews. In John chapter 5, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. There was a feast. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, of halt, of withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, troubled the water, and whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity Thirty and eight years, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me in to the pool. But while I am coming, another step it down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed, and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, our story begins with Jesus going to Jerusalem, and it was one of two miracles that Jesus did while he was in Jerusalem. He went to a place, the Scripture says, that was called the sheep market. It was a place to where the sheep was sold. And while he was there, he stopped by a place called the uh, place of Bethesda. Bethesda being house of five porches, also better known as a house of mercy. At this place, Jesus stopped having five porches. It was a place to where a great multitude, a large number of people stopped. Now, the people that stopped there at this place that had five porches, the Bible takes time to describe what kind of people stopped there. There was actually five kind of people that stopped there. Maybe more, but the scriptures is specific. There was five porches, and there was five kinds of people that stopped there. First, there was impotent people. It's amazing that our world today talks a great deal about impotence. There's a great deal about impotence. They lead it, uh, uh, they, they, they lean on the conversation of sex. Sexual impotence is a big thing. It's, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if some of you youngsters are getting literature 
sexual impotence. It's on TV. It's all the only ads. Sexual impotence. If you don't have it, they make you think you got it because uh, somebody, some, some guy with a white coat on is trying to describe what sexual impotence is. It's his version of sexual impotence. And so if you're sitting there with your wife, she obviously going to be convinced that uh, whatever that doctor says, that ain't my husband, amen, and uh, even women are sexually impotent. The whole world right now is just overrun with this idea of impotence. Impotence means to be without power. Here, Jesus wasn't stopping by to heal people that had sexual dysfunction. However, today our world is just inundated over sexual dysfunction. But at this, this house of mercy, there was a porch for those who were impotent. If you want to put sexual dysfunction on there, you can go ahead and do that. But there were people who didn't have any power. Impotent means they didn't have any power. They were weak. They were uh, unable to uh, muster up strength when they needed it. At this place, there were people who were blind, people who were physically blind, unable to see. People, uh, according to what John says, who are halt. Halt means immediately stopped. Something halted them. And then there were people who were withered. That means dried up. That usually means old people. You know, old people are looked at as they're dried up. They're dry and crusty. You know, it's what the young tried to put on old people. They're wrinkly. And so there was withered people there. And then when we get down to verse 5, that was a person who had a problem for 38 years. So there were five porches. And on these porches, there were all of these people who had various issues. This one particular porch had, I'm sure, people who had issues for a long time issue. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, and I feel led to talk about this tonight, because uh, when, when the Lord spoke to my heart about this, I like to seek the Lord as to what to say. I don't just like to come off the top of my head. If you do, most of the time you will miss what the Spirit is saying. But I'm a visionary. I admit by that, uh, the Bible says in the book of Joel and in the book of Acts that many times that God will speak to some of us through dreams and through visions. And I'm a person that God does that for some time. I'm not trying to set myself up as any greater or any better than anybody. It just happens to be one of the ways that he speaks to me. The scripture says that for some of us, he'll speak to us in the night while we sleep. And I happen to be a person that God will do that from time to time. September 10th here, just a few days ago, the Lord spoke to me. And he spoke to me in a dream about midnight. I went to bed about 1130. And about midnight, I had a dream. And in this dream, the Lord showed me men. It was predominantly men, males. But what he showed me was these men who began to be piled on top of one another. They were piling on top of one another. And as they were piling on, one, on top of one another, they were dying. And they were dying from hamstring uh, injuries. Their hamstrings were uh, cut off. And as their hamstrings were being cut off, uh, what happened was, uh, there was a key of, of faith that had fallen to the ground, and, and I know it was a key of faith, and I'm, to make the, the vision short, don't tell you all everything right now, I know it was a key of faith because of the person involved. Uh, he had me to pick up the key of faith, and as I went further into the dream, I saw all these men falling on what seemed like a bed, and they were dying, just falling on top of one another, and each one was dying of a hamstring in, uh, injury. And so I shouted out, these men are dying. They need water. And the Lord spoke. He said they need more than water. And so 
as I begin to ask the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? What is this all about? I searched the scriptures to see about, is there anybody in the scriptures that ever, anything the Bible talks about hamstring? And what I found out was that when you want to cripple your enemy, God had David to do it, and he had uh, uh, others to do it. If you cripple your enemy, the way you cripple him, and they crippled the men, they crippled the horses, they crippled the oxen, you cut off their hamstring. And if you cut off the hamstring, you make them useless. And so the Lord began to minister to me and to make a long vision, a dream short. He says that my people, my, my people, my men, my women, my children, they are dying because they are handicapped. They're being handicapped by the enemy. Hamstring, we don't even think about it. And to be honest with you, I didn't even know such a thing was even done myself as all the study I've done in my lifetime. I didn't even know. I had to research and see. That's what you do to your enemy when you catch him. You cut his hamstring. You cut his horse's hamstring. And you cut the oxen hamstring. And you do that to incapacitate them so they can't be used again. And he said, the enemy has caught my people, many of them, and he has hamstrung them. He's, he's, he's hamstrung my men, hamstrung my women, hamstrung those who say they are believers. And, and he began to deal with me because he deals with me in metaphors and many times in pictures. The Hebrew language is a language of pictures. And he knows I'm simple. He has to play romper room with me and show me things. And so he began to show me in pictures. He says, Look at the church. He says, when you come to the church, he says, most of the time you only have one or two handicapped spots. He said, but the truth of the matter, most of the people, if not all of the signs, the parking spots ought to be handicapped spots because the people are impotent, they're blind, they're lame, they're withered, and some of them are dealing with issues that are 38 years or longer, issues that started when they were kids being left by their parents, being abandoned by their fathers, being mistreated in some, some way, being the children of abusive parenting or being molested when they were young and never recovering, being discriminated against. I mean, the list just went on. I can't even rehearse all of it. But he says, many of them impotent, have no power, saying they're filled with the Holy Spirit, but they really aren't. We look at the handicapped spots and we, we point them out for the people who are bent over and walking slow. But the truth is many of them, if not all, most of them are spiritually handicapped, unable to get a prayer through, and yet they say they're believers, unable to read their Bible. And that's what he really dealt with me. He says they're handicapped because they can't get to the Word. They can't read the word. The enemy has handicapped them to the place where the Holy Bible is no longer a, a, a tool that they can reach. See, when the enemy handicapped, or when, when God told David to handicap their horses and handicap uh, them by hamstringing them, it was so that they couldn't use that no more. And so what Satan has done has hamstrung many of my believers indoctrinated them with doctrines of devils, or indoctrinated them in the flesh that they feel like they can't use the word to get out of their situations, to recover from sickness, to recover from illness, to bring the word into their finances to recover, to bring it into their marriages, to bring it into their singleness. They're hamstrung, and they're dying as a result of it. And so, when I said, they need water, he says, no, they need faith. They need faith in my word again to know that my word is what's going to bring them out of the situation. Not religion, but my word. Amen. And so he began to just speak to me, and as he's still speaking, that we need to start declaring that I'm not going to be handicapped anymore. Amen. We look at those 
who are parking in the handicapped spot, and we say, I'm not handicapped. Amen. Why? Because physically, you seem to be okay. But emotionally and spiritually and many of the other ways that Jesus died for us, we are not okay. And, and, the, and the problem was that when he shows up to bring mercy, we won't cry out for mercy. The house of porches, my house is a house of prayer. My house is a house of mercy. My, and you, you've made it a place of confusion. You, that's why it's not about personality. It's not about me. The, me, the me-itis. It's about Jesus. It's a house of mercy. It's not about who did what. It's a house of mercy. It's not about who said what. It's a house of mercy. Amen. Because even those of us who think we are strong, we may be blind in an area. Those of us who are not blind, we're halted by something. In other words, you was doing good, and then all of a sudden, we all know, I was okay until. That's halt. I was doing fine until I, I lost my, until this happened. I lost my job. That's. That'll halt you. My marriage broke up. Oop, I halt it. You know, one of my kids got in trouble with the law. Oh, that halted me. Somebody said something. Oh, I'm halted now. So the church is a place or a house of mercy. And Jesus wants to heal. We're all handicapped to a degree. Hello? Our problem is we won't wait till the water's troubled. They were there waiting for what had happened in the past. Read it. It's right there in verse 4. For they, uh, it says, they will, verse 3, they were waiting for the moving of the water. They were waiting for the moving of the water. They waited until the water was moving. Jesus came. To move the water. They had heard at least that an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Praise God. We got to wait on Jesus, but we got to admit that I'm not going to move till he helped me with my lack of power. Spiritual power, well, you can handle anything. Hello? You can handle anything. I'm blind. I can't see. I can't see how I'm going to get up out of this dilemma I'm in. I can't see how I'm going to make it tomorrow. I can't see how to get through this or, or go on from here. I can't see. But if I wait for the moving of the water, Jesus will help me to see. The worst thing in the world is try to run when you blind. The worst thing in the world is try to run when you lame. Hello. When you withered and dried up, my God, you need some water to fix that situation. Praise God. But the first thing we've got to do, even if we got long-time issues, and there are a lot of people got long-time issues, they don't know how to wait on Jesus to say, I've been dealing with insecurity since I was a girl. I've been dealing with insecurity since I was a little boy. When I was in the playground in middle school, I had the same issue. I was either bullied then or I'm the same bully I was then. If you didn't play marbles with me then, I acted this way. Or I took your marbles. 38 years. I've been divorced 38 years. And I still hate men. I still think women's is skanky. Because the way the one done me. I don't trust him. So I sleep with all I can sleep with. Because the one done me that way. That's a 38-year-old issue, players. Amen. I hate white people. Because that one white person that cut me off in traffic. Or fired me on my job. 
I hate black people because that one black person that intimidated me or cussed me out, that's a 38-year issue. But Jesus comes to deliver you from your handicap. Prejudice is a handicap. I can't stand authority because anybody that ever had authority over me abused me. So can't nobody tell me nothing. That's a 38-year issue. And it's hindering you from keeping a job. It's hindering you from a promotion. It's hindering you from working with others. You didn't learn how to work with a group. They always let you have your way. It's been a 38-year issue. Now you can't work with a group. You come to a church, you can't be a part of a church. You can't be a part of a team. Why you couldn't play basketball? Because if you didn't start, you wasn't going to come back. Some people got them issues still. But Jesus came to deliver us, even from long-term issues. Even if your father left you, that could psychologically scar you. If you don't meet Jesus, somebody might try to paint a picture that he didn't love you. But until he looks you in the face and tells you point blank that I didn't love you, then you don't know for that to be the truth. Amen. And you can go through life believing that my father left me because he don't love me. But you don't know the circumstances. And it's easy for this world and movies and people to paint that picture in your face. And he may have left because he didn't know his father left him and he didn't know how to come back. Maybe the woman in his life wouldn't let him come back. You don't know that. If you never sat at a table with both mama and daddy and, and, and had both of them to explain, And that could be a 38-year-old issue. And if you don't get free from it, you will do the same thing to your son. Yes, you will. Not all men, but a whole lot of men will do it. They felt like my dad didn't care for me, so I don't have to care for my son or my daughter. But Jesus comes to bring deliverance. But you have to be willing to admit, I need your mercy. Can you say amen? Yeah. Come on, praise the Lord with me. Come on, praise him with me. And you got to say, I'm not going to be handicapped no more. Amen. Praise God. Acts 3 and 1. In Acts 3 and 1, we have a similar situation. And it involves... What happens to Christians who don't take time to realize that when they are saved, when you get and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't receive a half Savior. You don't receive a Savior who's impartial to some. He loved one race of people better than others. He chooses one person over another. But what Jesus does is he calls all of us to come and drink at the fountain. And it's a spiritual fountain. And he says, come, those of us who are thirsty. And it's just like when you take a drink of water, a drink of, of a beverage. Uh, you drink as you desire. But in the book of Acts chapter 3, verse 1, we have an interesting story that Peter and John went up together into the temple at the uh, hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And there was a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Now we've got another place that uh, the children of God, the people of God, those who love God, would gather. In this case, uh, it's the temple gate, but it's called the beautiful gate. And this man was laid from his mother's womb or soon as he could walk at this place, and his 